D-Day plus one. The Allied forces have landed on the beaches of Normandy, France, and they are driving back the Germans. Among the hedgerows in France, Brigadier General Norman Dutch Coda is leading his group of soldiers. He comes through one particular hedgerow and he sees a group of American GIs pinned down by Germans who have fortified a stone farmhouse. They're being shot at, they can't do anything. He takes in the situation and he recognizes there's a young army captain who's in charge. And so he makes his way through the German gunfire and he gets up to this young man and he says, son, what seems to be the problem? Why are you and your men not attempting to take that building? And this captain, eyes like saucers, look at Brigadier General and he says, sir, the Germans, they're in there and they're shooting at us. He says, all right, son. And he unclips two grenades from his vest. He says, I'll show you how to take a building with Germans in it. You and your men start shooting. And he gets up and he runs back through the enemy fire to his men and he lays out the plan. They're gonna go down the hedgerow to get as close to the building as they can. And he says, follow me. And he bursts through the hedgerow. Woo! And he and his men charge this farmhouse and they're shooting and they throw grenades through the windows and he gets up and he kicks the door in and he throws a grenade in and it explodes and he, his men follow him into the house. And the Germans come streaming out of the back side of the house. Coda comes back. He's not a young man. In fact, he was the oldest American officer to land on D-Day. He walks back to that young captain and he says, son, did you see that? Did you see how I took the house? The captain looks at him and says, yes, sir, yes, I see. He says, good. I'm not going to be there to do it for you again. I can't do it for everybody. The thing that amazes me about this story is not just the unbridled heroism of Brigadier General Norman Dutch Coda. It's that this young captain who for the previous six months had been in training, for the previous six months had been preparing to go to war, and the day before had landed on the beaches of Normandy under intense enemy gunfire, was surprised that he was being shot at. He was surprised that he was being shot at. Maybe you found yourself there. Maybe you've chosen to live a new life. You're trying to live a life for God. Maybe you've chosen to adopt a new prayer routine, and all of a sudden, before you know it, it's just really hard. It doesn't seem like the people in my classes care, or everybody is against me. It's just really, really hard. You need someone like Brigadier General to come into your life. And not only that, there are people on your campus that need someone to come into their life to help them to learn how to overcome the obstacles, how to overcome the challenges. My name is Mark, as Emily said. I've been working with Focus for the last 12 years. It's been such an amazing and exciting time to see how much it's changed throughout the course of that time. And I feel, I feel like I've got a little bit of notoriety. In fact, I was walking through the concourse the other day and somebody comes running up to me and they say, are you, are you? And I said, yeah, I'm speaking on Thursday. They said, oh, I thought you were Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> no, he said, oh good, I've, you were looking a little overweight. I said, thank you, I really, I really appreciate that. No, it's, it's really great to be here. I love being here. I think this is such a fantastic place to bring together leaders and to start looking at what God is calling us to do. As Emily said, I've been married for the last 12 years. I have a beautiful family. They're back in Colorado right now. And I know my wife's not here, but I just want to give you a little bit of my wife's resume so you'll think I'm more impressive. <laughs> my wife is, uh, she's a half Ironman triathlete. She, com she completed it 364 days after having our third child. She's a black belt in Taekwondo. And she's just all around amazing. And I'm so blessed to be with her. And she just keeps me humble in so many ways. In fact, uh, as I was preparing for this, one of the things that they recommended was that I really work to make sure that I connected with all of you college students, that I was trying to be relevant. And so I went back and I put on my freshman 15 again. <laughs> it's, uh, 
it's really uncomfortable because I've done seven Tough mutters and I've got another one this summer. It's going to be hard to get rid of that. But everybody's like, Mark, I'm sure it's just sympathy weight, like sympathy weight right? Your wife is uh, seven, almost eight months pregnant. I'm sorry, she's six months pregnant. It's probably just sympathy weight. She doesn't give me any sympathy for this. I get nothing. I just want to, I want to open with this particular story. If you have your Bible, you can open it up. And before I read the Bible, I like to pray. So could I pray for you guys? Would that be okay? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we give you thanks and praise for the grace and goodness that you show to us this and every day. I ask, Lord, that you would send your Holy Spirit upon this place, that you would inflame the minds and the hearts of these men and women who you have drawn here because you have such a particular plan and purpose for each and every one of them. You know how you desire to use them. You know what you need to do within them in order to light them on fire, to send them on mission. I ask, Lord, that you would give me your words to speak, that they would not hear me, but they would hear you, that you would speak to their hearts and you would call them, Lord. You would call them into a radical new availability to you, and that in that, Lord, you would be able to make use of them in such a way as to radically change the world. Put people in their lives, Lord, whose lives they can change by your grace. We ask all of this in Jesus' most holy name. In Luke chapter 5, and behold, men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they sought to bring him in and lay him before Jesus, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles and into their midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? When Jesus perceived their questions, he answered them, why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, take up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose before them and took up that on which he lay and went home, glorifying God. Can you imagine what this was like? These men probably were not walking down the street and said, hey, there's a paralyzed guy. Let's pick him up and take him to the party. He was probably their friend. He was probably walking with them in some ways. Maybe they were there when he was injured and they desired to see him made whole. Maybe they were family members and they got there because they had hope that Jesus would do something in their friend's life. And so they arrive. Imagine you're carrying your friend on a stretcher and you arrive and it's a big party, right? And they can't get in. They can't crowd past the crowd. And so they, one of them, being a genius, says, hey, let's go around the back and see if there's a back way in. So they go around the back. Guess what? There's no way to get in. So then the genius says, let's take him up on the roof. Your buddy's on a stretcher. And you're going to take him up on the roof? Can you imagine the guy's probably like, no, guys, it's okay. Like, you don't have to. It's, no, it's all right. No. And they're lifting him up. They hoist him up onto the roof. And they get up there like, what did you think you were going to find? A skylight? I don't know. They break open the roof of the house. And they lower this down, this guy down before Jesus. And they're probably looking at all this. And they're thinking, Jesus is going to do something powerful. We've heard about this man. He's a wonder worker. And they lower him down. And they're probably laying around this hole, looking down, watching. And Jesus was probably like, what, what's going on with the roof? And then this guy comes down, and he sees them, and he says, because of your faith, your sins are forgiven. And they were probably like, yeah, oh, uh, yeah, that's good too. I mean, yeah, let's, I'm ex, hmm. And then the grumbling in the heart of the scribes and the Pharisees, and Jesus then makes this man whole as well because of their faith. We learned earlier this week that death is not the worst thing. Sin is the worst thing. Being physically whole is not the most important thing. Being spiritually whole is the most important thing. 
We all have had people who have lifted up, uh, us up in our lives in order to bring us to Jesus. You wouldn't be here if you hadn't had friends who had seen that in some way you needed to be carried to Jesus. That's why we are all here. I'm no different. I was raised in a great Catholic family. My family, my parents did everything they could in order to bring me to faith. We never missed mass, ever, no matter what the circumstances. We always went. In fact, in my entire life, before I turned 18, there were only like two times that I ever missed mass, and one was because I had lice. Sorry, transparency, not vulnerability. But as hard as my parents tried to teach us how to pray and to teach us how to know the faith, when I got off to college, I had set my aspirations on something I really desired. I wanted to be Jen Belushi in Animal House. I wanted to live the party lifestyle. And you guys know when you set your goals that high, they're not difficult to achieve, are they? <laughs> it didn't take long. It was about a week and a half. And I was living the party lifestyle. I loved going to parties. I loved hosting parties. I loved being the guy that sold the red solo cups. I could hand out liquid joy to everybody who came and it lasted for three to five hours. And then the next day, everybody walked away with a hangover. That was the life that I sought to live. That was the life that I had experienced and desired. And it was empty, friends. It was completely empty. At the end of my freshman year, pretty much empty. Not much going on. Some guys that were RAs in my dorm said, hey, you should apply to be an RA. You can get free room and board. We like partying with you. It'd be great. So I said, sure. At the end of that first semester, a guy came and knocked on my door. His name was Jason. He said, Mark, I need to check out. I said, Jason, you don't have to check out. It's just Christmas break. You can just go home and come back. He said, Mark, I have a brain tumor. I'm probably not coming back. And I was struck to the heart by that. So I went and I checked him out and I came back. I walked into my room and I remember just this burden. I remember falling on my knees. God, I know you're out there. Will you please do something for Jason? Will you please heal him? Please heal him. Friends, to that point in my life, I don't think I'd ever truly done something selfless. I'd never done something to truly will the good of someone else. And that night, Jesus opened a crack in the door of my heart. Later, he put an amazing young woman in my life. She was not Catholic. She didn't like the Catholic Church. She attacked the Catholic Church. And as I said, I didn't know much about my faith. And so when she would attack the Catholic Church, I would attempt to defend it by making up the answers. <laughs> Apologetics 101, do not make up the answers. It is not effective. But we were having an argument one night and she just looked at me in the middle of an argument and she said, Mark, I know what your problem is. And I'm in the middle of the argument, right? I'm heated. I'm like, oh, I'm so excited for you to tell me what my problem is. This is exciting. <laughs> and she said, Mark, you don't know Jesus. And that crack that had started when Jason left school, Jesus was standing at the door of my heart and he was knocking. Mark, I want in. Now, I knew what she wanted for me. She wanted me to get saved. And of all the things I didn't know about the Catholic Church, the one thing that I could remember at that moment was, we don't believe in the golden ticket. Willy Wonka doesn't win the day on this one, guys. What am I supposed to do? Because I want that so bad. I want it so bad. And Jesus is standing at the door of my heart and he's knocking and I can ex feel it. And I remember him saying to me, Mark, I know you're a screw up. His words, not mine. <laughs> he knows how to speak to my heart. I know you're a screw up and I know that you're not done sinning. But Mark, if you invite me to be at the center of your life, I will come in and I will never abandon you. And no matter how hard you run, no matter how hard you try to get away from me, I won't let you get away from me. And I understood what it meant to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
and I wanted so badly. And I said, how do I start a relationship with Jesus? She said, it's easy. You just pray this prayer, repent of your sins. You ask Jesus to come and be at the center of your life. I said the prayer, tears and snot and weeping. I repented of my sins for really the first time in my entire life. And I realized at that point that I'd been standing on the gates of hell until that point. And I realized when Jesus says the gates of hell will not withstand you, what he meant. We build up the gates of hell in our hearts. And Jesus Christ wants to knock them down. Jesus Christ wants to come into your life, friends. He desires to be at the very center of your life. He wants everything. He wants you more than anything. And many of you have had profound experiences through these last several days. But Jesus Christ wants more than these last several days. He wants all of you. And if you want to make a commitment today to live the rest of your life for Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to make that commitment. I want to invite you to pray with me. St. Paul says if you profess with your lips and believe in your heart, you will be saved. I'm going to put a prayer up here. I want you to look at this prayer. If this prayer expresses the desire of your heart, I invite you to pray with me right now. It makes a difference, friends. I shared this prayer with a missionary who I'd been walking with for several years, and at the end she said, oh, that was different. So yeah, when you say it, it changes everything. Will you pray with me right now? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, I believe that you know me and love me. I have not always chosen to love you and have broken my relationship with you through my sins. Thank you for sending your son Jesus who proved you love me on the cross. Jesus, I open the door of my heart and I invite you to be at the center of my life, to be my savior and my Lord. Come by your Holy Spirit and help me to live the gospel with my whole life, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that night, when I prayed that prayer, the room that I was in smelled of incense, and I was transported back to my third grade when in the Catholic school that I, my parents sent me to, we would go down to the church, and we'd have adoration, exposition, and incense. They burned this incense, and it was the very same incense I experienced in that room that night. It was a profound encounter with the Lord. And I remember walking away from the dorm that night and looking up at the, sc- at the stars, and it was like the scales had fallen from my eyes. And it was like it was the first time I was ever seeing the world. And I realized that God had a plan and a purpose for my life. And the plan and the purpose for my life was that I would become a saint. I was called to become a saint. And not a slide in by the skin of your teeth saint. Not a last minute saint. But like a big S saint. Like they'd make holy cards and statues out of you. You'd have churches named after you, which is why I grow a beard, because I think it's going to look better in a statue. (laughs) And that's what God is calling you to as well, because, friends, people need saints in their lives, and you're the saints. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be faithful and allow God to work into your life. And God wants to make use of you. And you should celebrate. If today is the first day that you've made this commitment out loud, I ask that you'd write it down on your program, that you write it down on your, uh, someplace where you will remember and you come back each year to this day and you celebrate this. This is a big, big thing. Too often, I think as Catholics, we're like, oh yeah, they accepted the gospel. Oh, that's cool, man. That's a huge thing. Somebody made Jesus Christ the center of their life. It changes absolutely everything. It changes everything. And I didn't understand this until I read this quote by Father, Father Rianero Contalamesa, who's the preacher to the papal household. He was the preacher for St. John Paul II. He was the preacher for Benedict XVI. He was the preacher. He is the preacher for Pope Francis. And he says this about the relationship with Jesus. He says, if Christianity, as so rightly has been said, is not primarily a doctrine, but a person, Jesus Christ, It follows that the proclamation of this person and of one's relationship with him is the most important thing, the beginning of all true evangelization. 
to reverse this order and to put the doctrines and moral obligations of the gospel before the discovery of Jesus would be like putting the carriages in front of the railway engine that is supposed to pull them. It gets it backwards. You don't have to help people realize that they should stop sinning. Start with Jesus. If you start with Jesus, it gives them a reason. It gives them a reason because God wants to invite them and you on mission. You see, before Jesus took his high post of command, he ascended into heaven, as Bishop Barron told us. He said this to the apostles and the disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the close of the age. And Jesus Christ desires to make disciples. He desires for you to make disciples. For you to make disciples. The Great Commission is not about being a disciple, it's about making disciples. And that's not an easy thing, which is why I believe Father Consolamesa's quote makes so much sense to me. It changes everything. When you put Jesus first, you put things in the proper order. And he says this, the person of Jesus opens the highway of the heart for the acceptance of everything else. If you've been walking with somebody and trying to help them to to change their life, and you haven't proclaimed the message of Jesus to them, you might be doing it backwards. Give them the relationship, the reason to follow, to change their life. And he says this, anyone who's at once known the living Jesus has no further need to be goaded along. We ourselves burn with the desire to know his thought, his will, his word. If you don't know Jesus, you can't share Jesus. You just prayed with me, you know Jesus. You have the opportunity to share Jesus. And this is what he's asking us to do. And he teaches us through his apostles what we're to do. St. Paul says, and what you have heard from me before many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Teach to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This is the process of making disciples. Find people who know Jesus, who are faithful, and teach them who can teach others as well. Teach them who can teach others as well. You see, the way we see what God has done is that the saints have replicated, especially the apostles, replicated what Jesus did. They saw how Jesus operated. They saw that he had went out and he selected 12 men to walk with. And of those 12 men, he selected three others in particular, Peter, James, and John, in order to pour his life into. And he taught them what it meant to follow him. He walked with them, he prayed with them, he strengthened them, he built them up. And then from that, he sent them out to go therefore and make disciples. And we know that they've done that. I just wanna give you an example here. So we see that St. John went out, and we know that St. John walked in discipleship with Polycarp and St. Ignatius of Antioch. And then St. Paul went out, and he walked in discipleship with St. Timothy and St. Titus. We see that this is the process that was followed in the immediate generations after Jesus. And this is what we're being asked to do as well. And the reason why this is exciting is because it's easy. Because friends, I love being here. I love getting up and talking to you guys. And I'm sure some of you are like, man, it'd be really cool to get up on stage in front of a few people. I don't know about this, man. That's crazy. There's all those people out there. But this is not the work of mission. On Monday, I had this tremendous opportunity. There's a man who I'd met in my parish about four years ago. Our families became friends, we walked together, we prayed together, I invited him to join my Bible study. Our families would spend time almost every Sunday getting together, having brunch and just talking about what God is doing. And in July, he and his family moved to Virginia and they were back to visit family over Christmas vacation. And he sat down with me on Monday and he said, Mark, it's just really hard. Like the parish, there's just no other guys in the parish that really care about their prayer life. They don't really seem like they wanna do anything. I just don't know what to do, it's so hard. It's just so hard. And I said, Justin, let me show you something. And I pulled out a napkin 
And I, showed, I drew out this image of what Jesus did with John and with Paul and Timothy and Titus and how Jesus was calling us to go and make disciples. I said, if there's nobody in your parish that you can walk with, then you have to make some. That's what Jesus is calling us to do, to make disciples. Not to find disciples, to make disciples. And he said, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. I said, look, Justin, I want you to understand this is a team sport. You can find other people. You can walk in faith with them. They can strengthen you. You can strengthen them. Sometimes you have down days. Sometimes they have down days. You strengthen each other. But you draw people around. And I drew his name onto a piece of paper. And then I drew a little line up and I put my name there. I said, what I want you to understand, Justin, is that others have been pouring their lives into me over the course of many years. There was Jim Jansen who walked with me in discipleship when I was in college. And the rest of his team, Tom and Kate and Jen, and they invested me in deep and profound ways. And it made me realize that it's not one person, because I'm really prideful. I'll go on to campus and I'll meet somebody, or I'll go into my parish and I'll meet somebody, and I'll think, I'll tell God, like, awesome, God, now you can start working in their life. And he's like, <laughs> Mark, Mark. No, I've been working in their life from the very beginning. Now you get to watch what I'm doing. That's what he wants us to do, to become friends with people, to walk with them, to teach them divine intimacy, to have an authentic friendship with them, and help them to know that they too can make disciples. Because we've been going throughout this week, our win day, our build day, and our send day, and all of this is awesome, but if it ends the moment you get on the bus or the moment you step off the curb, it's all wasted. You have the opportunity to pour your life into other people, to spend the rest of your life on mission, to help people to have impact in their lives. And God wants to make use of it. You don't have to do big things all the time. It's not always the sit down, draw out the plan and what God is gonna do. Let me tell you a story about how powerful God is. Several years ago, there was a young woman at U the University of Northern Colorado. Her name was Aisha. And she'd been walking in discipleship and Aisha, it was coming up on summer and the missionaries were encouraging Aisha, you need to figure out what you're gonna to read to stay spiritually alive and how you're gonna pray and what you're gonna do. And she's like, okay. One of them recommended that she read Story of a Soul, the autobiography of St. Therese. And she's reading through it and this idea of doing little things with great love. I wanna do little things with great love. And so she stops and she thinks about it for a little while. She's like, I have a pretty good smile. I could smile. What if I just smile? God, I'll just make that my little way. And so it's like the second week of summer vacation. She's like, I'm going to go to Mass. And so she gets up in the morning and she's walking to Mass. And as she's walking to Mass, she sees a woman dragging her trash down from her house to the curb. It must have been trash day. And she's like, okay, now's my opportunity to do the little thing for Jesus. Okay, God, here I go, right? So she just the brightest smile she can possibly put on. It's a hundred times better than mine. And she walks by this woman and she just smiles at her and says, good morning. And the woman looks at her a little funny, right? She's like still in a nightgown or something and she's like dragging her trash out and she's like, why are you smiling at me? But she smiles and Aisha goes on and goes to mass, doesn't think much of it. The next day she goes back to mass again. She walks, doesn't see the woman this day. Uh, gets to Mass, sits down, prays through the Mass. At the end of Mass, she's making her Thanksgiving. And a woman comes up from the parish, a regular, and taps on her shoulder. And she says, I'd like to give you a blessing. And Aisha's like, um, okay. So she wants to be polite. So she gets up. And this woman takes her into the back of the church, into the cry room. And in the cry room, she sees a woman sitting in a chair, her face in her hands, sobbing. <laughs> Shoulders heaving, everything. And Aisha's a little bit weirded out by this. And she's like, are you okay? And the woman lifts her face. And Aisha sees it's a woman from the day before. The trash can lady. And she looks at Aisha and she says, yesterday when you walked by, I was feeling pretty down. And when you smiled at me, I realized you have something I don't. But I want it. And so I watched where you went. And I saw you go into the Catholic Church. And I've been away from the Catholic Church for 16 years. 
And I want to return to mass and confession. Thank you for smiling at me. God desires to take little things and use them to transform the world. God desires you to find just a few people, two, three, four, five, if you're an overachiever, maybe 12, <laughs> and to pray for them and to share your life with them and to walk with them in friendship and allow God to do something in their life and to invite them and to lay out this vision for spiritual multiplication. And if you share the vision of spiritual multiplication and you focus deeply on those few, God can use it to transform the world. You see, the other thing that I shared with Justin was that we don't have to do everything, right? The Great Commission says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Do you guys know how big the world is? 7.6 billion people. Okay, look around in here. There's like 8,000 people in this whole conference. And there are 7.6 billion people out there that need to be made into disciples of Jesus Christ. And some of you might be going, I'm so excited, I'm gonna go overseas, I'm gonna preach the gospel. And others of you are like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I can't do that. God doesn't necessarily need all of those things. Some of you, I'm convinced, will be called to go overseas to make a big difference in people's lives, to spend your whole life on mission over there. Others, you're called to pour your life into a few. For now and for always to help them to come to know this, to help them to understand that there is an opportunity for them to make Jesus known and to make disciples. And if you just pour your life into three people and you pour it deeply into them and you teach them how to pray and you walk with them and you trust that God's gonna make up what's lacking in you through your own frailty and negligence, then God can make use of that and he can bring about greater fruits. And if you teach those three to reach three others, who can then reach three others, who can then reach three others. In five years, those others will be 243 committed disciples of Jesus Christ. In 10 years, it will be nearly 60,000 committed disciples of Jesus Christ. In 20 years, there will be 3.4 billion people committed to Jesus Christ because you're teaching people to live the Great Commission with the little way at the heart of it. And in 21 years, we could see God bless over 10 billion people. You see, if you look at it like this, you can just see very quickly that your small pouring into people can make all the difference in the world. It can make all the difference in the world. And this is what God is inviting you to do, to spend your life on mission. If you feel God beginning to draw your heart towards this, to be committed to make disciples of all nations, starting with those in your immediately, immediate surroundings, your family, your friends, to invite them, to walk with them, to pray for them, to pray with them. God wants to make use of you. God wants to make use of you. What happens here can't stay here. This is not Las Vegas. Everything you're experiencing, you're called to take back into the world, into your world. And you can change the world by changing a few people's lives. And I want to invite you. I want to do something different. I want to ask if you feel that God is calling you to make disciples, if you feel that God is calling you to spend the rest of your life on mission, if you believe that God desires to make use of you now, today, I want to ask you to stand up. Raise up disciples, God, I beg of you, please. I wanna pray for you. I wanna pray that God would make use of you, that God would pour you into the world, and that God would transform our world through you. Let's pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, this is an anointed generation. This is a group of people that you can use to transform the very world, the very fabric of our culture. Every man, woman, and child, Lord, can come to hear the gospel because of their faithful commitment to you. I ask, Lord, that you would brand into their heart the love of your cross, that you would pour your blood down upon them, that you would grant them your strength, and that you would enable them, Lord, every single day to commit to bringing you to the center of their heart, of their life, and that they would always look for 
for those opportunities to make you known in every place that they go. Pour blood and mercy and grace upon them, Lord, and allow through them your healing and your forgiveness to be poured out, Lord. Help them to have the strength of the friends who carry that paralytic man to the roof and lowered him down to you, Lord. Help them to have the faith of those friends. Enable them to know you, to love you, and to pursue you with all that they have. We pray this all in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. You can be seated. I want to close with this. St. John Bosco is amazing. He's a saint. You are called to be saints. You are called to be saints. Saints, they're crazy. I mean, they're absolutely out of their mind crazy. And you are called to be absolutely out of your mind crazy. Not like certifiably crazy, but like crazy crazy. Okay? And God wants you to do crazy things. So what would St. John Bosco do? So he would work with the young boys in Turin, Italy. And in Turin, Italy, he would oftentimes have these mass, and there would be lots and lots of boys. There was one day at mass, he went back to the tabernacle, and he took the ciborium out, and there were eight hosts in it. And there were 300 people in the congregation. And so he walks to the front, and he takes the ciborium with eight hosts in it. And he gives out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He gives out the eighth host. And there's still a long, long line of people waiting to receive Jesus. And so St. John Bosco reaches into an empty ciborium, and he takes Jesus out, and he gives it to the next boy. He reaches into the empty ciborium, and he takes Jesus out, and he gives it to the next boy. Again and again and again, until everyone had received Jesus. I believe that God wants to use you to reach into people's lives, to reach into places where Jesus is not readily apparent, and you will already find Jesus waiting there for you. If you want to change the world, just change a few people's lives. Amen? Amen. Thank you.